force on imaging in skin of color. The stage is yours, Professor Enzo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, you must be very tired of me. Huh? Hi, Mayo. But you're very passionate about photograph. Huh? Yes, sir. You, you took photo with everyone. Huh? Anything. Okay, okay. So, um, this morning, I will talk about hair and nail. Hmm? This is a very interesting topic, I think. Hmm? Right? Um, let's start with this image. I already showed you this image yesterday. Huh? Scarring or not? This is the question. But, of course, we can say that these patients have scarring alopecia. But, you know, I would like to stress the concept that we don't have to arrive at this point. Okay? We have time before the patient, you know, uh, becomes like this. Okay? We have to diagnose scarring alopecia when there is no scars, okay? So, uh, but at that stage, it's not so easy. Hmm? Uh, here we have two examples, okay? Of course, we may have an idea, hmm? but uh, I don't know, Michael, which one is scarring? Which one is scarring alopecia? Uh, okay, okay, so okay, okay. Okay, so let's keep it, let's keep it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, I agree. Okay, let's, we will come back to these cases. Even here, it's not easy to say, to say which one has uh, scarring alopecia. Hmm? Uh, so, which are the clues, the dermoscopic clues of a scarring alopecia? Of course, in scarring alopecia, we have fibrosis, okay? And on dermoscopy, fibrosis means bright white areas, okay? We may have uh, circumscribed white areas, okay? Globular white areas, dots. Hmm? These are more typical for folliculocentric alopecia. For example, ligam plano pilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, and so on, okay? This is uh, lichen plano pilaris, for example. Okay, but we may also have diffuse bright white areas in non-follicular centric alopecia. For example, this is uh, discolumus. Hmm? Okay, so now, uh, this is a case, okay, uh, so the question is always the same. Do we have a scarring alopecia or not? Do we see any bright white area here? No, I'd say no. Huh? But this is still like in plano pilaris. This is still a scarring alopecia, but an early stage, okay? So, in early stages or subtle cases, bright white areas may be absent, okay? So, we have to rely on other findings. So, I would like to stress this concept. Uh, which are the clues of non-scarring alopecia? Of course, the lack of bright white areas, but also the evidence of follicular units. And this means presence of hair shafts or follicular ostia, these roundish brown spots, okay? So, uh, of course, follicular ostia may be very evident, for example, here in alopecia areata, but sometimes they are quite subtle, okay? So they are not very, very easy to be seen. Okay, and what about dark skin, hmm? dark scalp? Here we have a Caucasian patient. Here we have a dark skin patient. Uh, there is a big difference. In dark scalp, we have these uh, pinpoint white dots corresponding to eccrine glands openings, okay? These are not visible in uh, Caucasians. Okay, and uh, so we can uh, use the presence of uh, these pinpoint white spots uh, to say if an alopecia is scarring or not, yes, uh, when we have a non-scarring alopecia, these, uh, these eccrine glands openings are regularly distributed, okay? On the other hand, when we have a scarring alopecia, they are interrupted by bright white areas, by the fibrosis, okay? So they are irregularly distributed. Okay, so uh, what about bright white areas in dark scalp? Of course, they are very easy to be seen where they are diffuse because we have a 
uh, higher contrast okay, with the surrounding skin, pigmented surrounding skin, but when we have globules, white globules, white fibrotic globules and dots, it's not easy because uh, fibrosis may be mistaken for uh, follicular or eccrine openings. So what we have to evaluate? We have to evaluate the regularity of these white dots because you, you can see here in scarring alopecia, they are irregularly distributed. On the other hand, in non-scarring alopecia, they are very regularly distributed. Okay, so the distribution is the clue. Okay, so now let's come back to our patients. Uh, the first one, scarring or not, in your opinion? Do we have bright white areas? Yes, yes, of course. This is scarring alopecia. This is lichen planus pilaris. Okay, please note that the bright white areas are, you know, whiter, brighter than the surrounding skin. Okay, second case. Do we have bright white areas? I'd say no. Do we have uh, evidence of uh, hairs? Yes, we have hair shaft. They are thinned, okay, but they are still there. And we also have follicular ostia, okay? So this is no scarring. Right, right, correct. This is no scarring. This is an androgenetic alopecia. Okay, even here, dark scalp. So I told you we have to evaluate the regularity of the pinpoint white dots. Uh, we have regular uh, distribution. So this is not scarring. This is androgenetic alopecia. You can see here thin airs. Okay. And this one? Irregular distribution. Right. So this is scarring. Okay. This is discoid lupus. This is scarring, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we have two types of alopecias. Okay. Scarring and not scarring. This is the, the typical classification, the most common classification. But I told you yesterday that I, I hate this classification. Huh? Anyway, no scarring alopecias, we have these ones. Scarring alopecias, we have these ones. These are the most common forms, of course. But, you know, uh, still, we have to uh, diagnose even a scarring alopecia in an early stage. So, I would like to change this classification. But then I will show you. So now just uh, a summary of uh, the differentiation between no scarring and scarring alopecia under dermoscopy. So no scarring, we have evidence of follicular units. Okay, scarring, we have bright white areas, and in dark scalp, we have to evaluate the regularity of pinpoint white dots. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So scarring or not? On the left. No? On the right? Yeah, you are too good. <laughs> okay, here. Yeah, they look quite similar. Hmm? Okay, of course, this is scarring. This is disco lupus. This is not scarring. This is an, a nodule with a tinea capitis. Okay, but you know, they look quite similar from a clinical point of view. Hmm? There is an overlap, a clinical overlap between these two uh, forms, scarring and non-scarring. Okay, so. Uh, I would like to change the classification. I, I would talk about diffuse alopecias and circumscribed alopecias. Okay, diffuse alopecias, we have alopecia areata, diffuse type, anagen effluvium, telogen effluvium. Okay, these are the diffuse ones. Okay, and then we have circumscribed alopecias. Okay, not a diffuse hair loss, but circumscribed. And we have non inflammatory patches. So alopecia areata, trichotillomania, and tinea capitis. Inflammatory patches, okay? Disco lupus, lichen panopilaris, follicular dyslecalvans, and dissecting cellulitis. And then we have two uh, particular clinical patterns, alopecia of the vertex and alopecia of the frontotemporal hairline, okay? Of course, please note that sometimes uh, inflammation is not very evident in very dark scalp, okay? So let's start with diffuse alopecias. Okay, so these are the three differential diagnoses. Hmm? Uh, I don't know, do you have anything in mind? What could be this? What could be this? Maybe we can have an idea. Huh? Telogen effluvium, managen effluvium, or alopecia areata diffuse type. Hmm? 
Okay, let, let, we will come back to these cases. Even here, these two cases look, you know, look pretty much similar. Okay, and even here in dark scalp, even more difficult to me. Okay, so let's see the demoscopic clues of these conditions. What do we have in alopecia areata? Mainly we have several things, but the two main uh, clues are the presence of exclamation mark hair, you can see here. Huh? And then we have also uh, yellow dots distributed in a regular pattern. Okay? These are the two main clues. Here you can appreciate much better the yellow dots. Okay? These are follicular openings, dilated follicular openings filled with keratin and sebum. Okay? And then, of course, yellow dots doesn't mean always alopecia areata. We can see them also in other conditions. For example, here we have uh, an androgenetic alopecia. But, you know, th there is a difference. The difference is that in alopecia areata, the distribution is very, very regular. Also, the size is very, very regular. They are very homogeneous among each other. On the other hand, in other alopecias, okay, they are pretty much uh, irregularly distributed. And, you know, the size and the shape is uh, a bit different, okay? And please note that in alopecia areata, uh, yellow dots correspond to the dilated follicular openings filled just by sebum, okay? So if the patient washes the, the hair, they may disappear, okay? So we have to pay attention to this. Okay, so uh, peculiarities in dark skin. Of course, yellow dots are not very easy to be appreciated. And then we have, of course, an accentuation of physiological pigmentation in long-standing cases. Okay, so this is very important. We do not have to confuse diffuse alopecia areata with alopecia areata incognita. Okay, this is another thing. This is not alopecia areata. Uh, this was described by a, a dermatologist from Italy, Genova, uh, Professor Rebora. And this is considered, you know, a telogen effluvium in females on an androgenetic alopecia background, okay? Indeed, we do not see yellow dots, exclamation, uh, you know, uh, mark uh, hair. We do not see them. We just see, you know, uh, follicular units with a single uh, hair shaft. Uh, we can see mm, sometimes upright uh, regrowing hair like this, okay? And we also have this nice wavy uh, hairs, okay? But we do not see uh, the typical clues of alopecia areata, okay? And these are, these, these, we can say that this has a very good prognosis, okay? Okay, anagen effluvium. What do we have in anagen effluvium? Several things, but you know, the, the most typical clues uh, are the presence of uh, broom-like uh, has and especially this flame like has okay and we also have these uh, constrictions of the hair shaft okay Paul Pincus constrictions due to the block of hair uh, growth okay intelligent effluvium what do we have intelligent effluvium basically nothing okay this is a diagnosis of exclusion we do not see the, the clues I showed you uh, before Okay, we may have several upright regrowing hairs, but this is not a typical clue of telogen effluvium. So, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Okay, so this is an overview of this uh, type of alopecia. In alopecia areata, we have exclamation mark hairs. We have regularly distributed yellow dots. In anagen effluvium, we have polpincus constrictions and broom like and flame like hairs. And in telogen effluvium, we do not have anything specific, okay? So, let's come back to our cases. What do we have here? What do we have? We have single hair follicles, upright hairs, empty follicles. We do not have anything in particular. So, what's this? Telogen effluvium, right, right. And here, here we have something, huh? we have this Huh? Anagen effluvium. Very good. Bravissimo. <laughs> okay, we have this 
flame like has we have these uh, constrictions of the hair shaft so this is anagen fluid correct and this let's take a look uh, this is clear cut alopecia areata correct we have our exclamation uh, mark like has we have very regularly distributed yellow dots so bravissimo again <laughs> okay diffuse alopecia areata uh, and here anagen effluvium you are too good anagen effluvium we have flame like hairs huh? we have the constrictions so anagen effluvium again hmm? okay uh, and here, what do we have here? Th this is a little bit more difficult, but you are too good, so, so what's this? Yeah, let's, yeah, 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 we have broom-like hairs, we have some constrictions of the hair shaft, so still, anagen effluvium. Okay, and this? Do we have uh, excl no 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 mm. no here you can see that you know the I did include androgenetic alopecia so it's not uh, anagen effluvium but we do not have any broom like hairs no we don't no, it's not always anagen effluvium come on uh, we do not see. I don't see, uh, let's, hear, let's, let's take a look here in the inset. I don't see flame-like hairs, I don't see broom-like hairs. So, I, I don't see anything. Yeah, telogenic fluid. Okay. Oh, I heard anagenic fluid, sorry, sorry. Okay, telogenic fluid. Okay, so let's move to another clinical pattern of alopecia. Uh, circumscribed, non-inflammatory allopechic patches. Okay, here we have three differential diagnoses, alopecia areata, trichotillomania, and tinea capitis. Huh? So, but maybe here we can have an idea. Right, Michael? Huh? <laughs> okay, here it's a little bit more difficult, let's say. Hmm? What could it be, this? Tinea capitis, okay, and this? Also. Trichotillomania, on, on the left, okay. Okay, we will come back to the cases. So, alopecia areata, we, we already know alopecia areata, okay. Exclamation mark has, and regularly distributed yellow dots. Hmm? Perfect. Trichotillomania, this is very nice, because, you know, uh, we have uh, broken hairs at different levels, of course, but the main clues uh, are the presence of uh, these very nice uh, hairs, the hook-like hairs, but also tulip hairs, as you can see here, mm, with a darker uh, distal end. And then we may also have some flame-like hairs, but they are not so typical. And we also have this sign, Vu sign, okay? So two or more uh, short uh, has coming from a, a single uh, follicular opening. So, but let's remember the hook-like hairs, tulip-like hairs, and also the blue sign. Okay, tinea capitis. Huh? I already showed tinea capitis you yesterday. Okay, what do we have? We have curved hair shafts. Okay, the comma-like hairs, the Kirschgrau-like hairs. Okay. And we also have this Morse code like hairs with this white band, okay? Which is more typical of endotrix or ectotrix. I, I told you yesterday. Ectotrix, yeah. Okay. Uh, peculiarities in dark skin. Hmm? Uh, we have a higher prevalence of coarse crew like and she shaped hairs. But we also have um, another thing the O shaped hairs. Because, of course, this happens more commonly in uh, African people, of course, because uh, they have uh, more curly uh, hair, okay? So, the summary. 
In alopecia areata, exclamation mark has regularly distributed yellow dots, trichotillomania, hook uh, and flame like hairs, tulip hairs, and blue sign. In tinea capitis, we have comma like uh, hairs, curse crew like hairs, and Morse code like hairs. Okay, so now let's come back to the cases. Here. Uh, do we have uh, hook like hairs, tulip pairs? No. Alopecia areata, correct. What do we have here? Exclamation mark. Okay, correct. Alopecia areata. And here, this is clear cut. Trichotillomania. We have hook like hairs, blue sign. I'd say also tulip like hairs. Huh? Nice tulip. Uh. Okay, trichotillomania. Correct. Uh, and here, so um, you said here trichotillomania and here tinea capitis. Okay. So what's this? Tinea capitis. Okay. We have comma like hairs or like hairs, course to you like hairs, tinea capitis. And here you, you, you said tinea capitis, but trichotillomania. Correct. So the opposite. Yeah, okay. Trichotillomania. Okay, the, the, the third clinical pattern, circumscribed inflammatory allopatric patches. Here we have these four differential diagnoses, disco lupus, lichen plano pilaris, folliculitis decalvans, and dissecting cellulitis. Okay? Even here, here I think that the, 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 the diagnosis here is even more difficult. Okay, in this group of conditions. So, you can have an idea in your mind. For example, here. What's disco lupus? Huh? Like a plano pilaris, this one. Okay. And this one? Disco lupus. Okay. It's difficult from a clinical point of view. Really. Especially in subtle or, uh, you know, in early stages, it's not like the book that we can see, you know, the typical, the prototypal of the, of the disease, okay? So even here, this is difficult to me. I don't know, maybe it could be like a plano pilaris also here. It could be disco lupus. Of course, in disco lupus, we have more circumscribed patches, but it's not always like that, okay? And here, here maybe we can have an idea, I think. Yeah. Huh? But here? Hmm? Okay. So, let's see the dermoscopic clues. Okay. Disco lupus. I, 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 I talked a lot about disco lupus. So, the main finding is the presence of follicular plugs. Okay. Due to the presence of follicular hyperkeratosis on histology. This is the main clue. And we also have these uh, nice linear curved vessels. Okay? They are, they are difficult to be seen in dark scalp, the vessels. Uh, as I told you yesterday, follicular plaques may also be seen in lichen simplex chronicus. Okay? But the difference is in the vessels. Okay? In this lupus, we have linear curved vessels. In uh, lichen simplex chronicus, we have dotted vessels, like psoriasis, because on histology we have a psoriatic hyperplasia, uh, psoriasis form of hyperplasia of the epidermis. Okay, in dark scalp, yeah, of course, uh, it's more difficult to see vessels, okay. Uh, we have more marked fibrosis, especially uh, white dots, white follicular uh, dots, which are not seen usually in uh, fair skin patients. And we also have pigmentary structures uh, in the form of, you know, uh, structureless brown areas or also peppering, so brown and gray dots. Okay? Like in plano pilaris, there is one main clue, which is the presence of perifollicular white scales. Okay? Sometimes uh, they appear like, you know, uh, tubular. Uh, scaling around the, the proximal part of the hair shaft. 
we also have br bright white areas, but it's not specific. It may be appreciated also in other scarring alopecias. Uh, okay, we do not have to confuse the follicular scaling, very follicular scaling of lichen planus pilaris with the follicular plaques of DLA. DLA, sorry. Okay, uh, there are some differences. The, the main difference is that um, in lichen planus pilaris, the, the scaling, uh, you know, uh, envelops the hair shaft. Okay, so we do not see uh, scaling where we do not have hair. Okay. In this colupus, hair shafts are replaced by the follicular plugs. So we see hyperkeratosis where we do not have hairs. Okay? And also the vessels. In lichen planus pilaris, it's difficult to see vessels. On the other hand, in this colupus, we have our linear curved vessels. Okay? We may also see other types of vessels, but this is the, 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 the main one and the most common and the most characteristic, we can say. Okay, perifollicular scaling. This is uh, important to underline. It's not written in our publications, maybe in one of my book, maybe. But uh, there is also um, perifollicular scaling in uh, seborrheic dermatitis, okay? Uh, this is very important because sometimes my residents, you know, uh, confuse seborrheic dermatitis with an early stage of uh, lichen plano pilaris. Uh, we have some differences. The color of the scaling is different because it, you know, it's uh, yellowish yeah, in seborrheic dermatitis because we have uh, uh, serum and also spongiosis. Um, on the other hand, it's white. It's white in lichen plano pilaris. Uh, and of course, uh, we have, uh, you know, fibrotic areas, but they are not visible in early stages. And uh, the scaling, the peripheral gas scaling is more diffuse in lichen planus pilaris. Okay, but you know, please consider the color. That's the main clue. Hmm? Okay, this is nice. This is uh, UV uh, dermoscopy. Do you use it? No? Okay. It's like, a, a, you know, a wood light in the dermoscope. Uh, I cannot name any, you know, but you can see here. Uh, so, in seborrheic dermatitis, we, de we have this very nice fluorescence, red fluorescence. Uh, in lichen panopilaris, we do not have it, okay? But, you know, uh, it's not always like this. Okay, peculiarities in dark scalp, lichen panopilaris. Uh, we may have pigmentary structures, mainly brown and gray dots, so peppering. And we also have uh, yeah, perifollicular white fibrotic halo in long-standing cases. Okay, folliculitis decalvans. Okay, this is easy, even, I say easier, uh, even from a clinical point of view. What do we have on dermoscopy? Uh, pretty much the same as clinical examination. So we have pustules, we have crusting, yellow crusting. And we have also this, uh, you know, tubular yellow uh, crusting around the hair shafts, okay? We also have tufted hairs, huh? but, you know, so many, many hair shafts coming from a single follicular opening, but uh, uh, tufted hairs uh, are not absolutely specific for follicular decalvans. They may also be appreciated for example, in lichen uh, plano pilaris uh, or discoid lupus, but uh, especially in lichen plano pilaris, actually. But, you know, it, the difference is in the, in the number of the hair shafts coming from the, the follicular opening. In follicular artistic advance, we have many, many hair shafts, usually more than five or ten, according to, you know, uh, several uh, publications. But let's say more than five, okay. Uh, in other conditions, we have less than five hair shafts coming from the follicular opening. Okay, so dissecting cellulitis. This is not so rare. Hmm? Right, Michael? It's not very rare. Uh, we have many things, okay? But the, the, the clue is the presence of this particular yellow dots called uh, 3D yellow dots because, you know, they are not like alopecia areata, 
they are a little bit uh, three-dimensional. Uh, and often there is a central uh, black dot, which is the, the broken uh, hair. Okay? Uh, perfect. So, this is the summary. Okay? Disco lupus, follicular plaques and linear cut vessels, which are uh, difficult to be seen in dust cough. Follicular, follicular testicle bands, we have pustules, yellow crusting, perifollicular yellow tubular scaling, uh, lichen panopillaris, perifollicular white scales, and dissecting cellulitis, uh, yellowish three dimensional uh, dots. Okay, so you told me this, this is lupus. No, lichen panopillaris. Lichen panopillaris. Okay, and this, this lupus. Okay, so what's this? Lichen panopillaris. Great, great. Do, what do we have? We have perifollicular white scales. We do not have pustules, crusting, and so on. We do not have uh, follicular plaques. We do not have uh, those nice three-dimensional uh, yellow dots. Okay, lichen panopillaris, correct. And here, you told me, you told me uh, lichen panopillaris, but w what's this? No, no, what's this? No, 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 it's too big to be a yellow dot. Pustule, it's a pustule. It's a pustule. Yeah, it's a follicular distal ones. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy in, in a very dark scalp. Eh? Eh? This is, of course, an African patient of mine. Yes, this is follicular distal ones. Okay, and here, even more difficult to me. Hmm? I don't know, it might be... Everything, Let, let's say mainly lichen planopillaris and uh, disco lupus, mainly lichen planopillaris in both these cases. So here, lichen planopillaris. Bravissima. Michael, sono bravissimi. Eh? Bra bravo is actually Italian, it's, it's, it's not French. Eh? Yeah, it's not French. And uh, when you say bravo, to a, a, a woman, you have to say brava, no bravo, bravo e brava. Eh? If, if you want to say you are too good, bravissimo. Eh? Okay, so bravissimo. This is like in panopillaris, we have perifollicular white scaling. We do not see hyperkeratosis where we do not have uh, hair, okay? Like in panopillaris. And this? Yeah, daily. We have follicular plugs, and these, you know, uh, have replaced the, the hair shafts. Okay, this is disco lupus. Much easier, isn't it? Okay. Here we can have an idea, let's say. Yeah, dissecting cellulitis. Yeah, dissecting cellulitis. Yeah, we have the three dimensional dots with the central black dots. Okay? Perfect. Dissecting cellulitis. And here, it's simple also from a clinical point of view, I'd say. <coughs> yeah, folliculitis, decapons. But we can confirm our clinical impression. We have pustules, we have uh, yellow perifollicular tubular scaling, we have the tufted hair, uh, with many, many uh, hairs coming from a single follicular opening. Okay, okay. Okay, this is, uh, in my view, one of the most difficult differential diagnoses, this clinical pattern. So alopecia of the vertex and the parietal areas, uh, it might be a scarring alopecia, but also the most common one, which is androgenetic alopecia. So these are the three differential diagnoses. Uh, this is quite common in African patients, uh, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia androgenetic alopecia and pattern lichen panopillaris, namely lichen panopillaris involving the parietal uh, areas. Uh, this is not so rare, especially in uh, women, okay? So here, uh, of course, we can have an idea, uh, but, uh, okay, you told me that this might be scarring, yeah? but lichen panopillaris or CCA? It's not easy. Huh? Okay, and here, also here, we can have an idea, but, you know, we cannot rely uh, completely on clinical examination. 
Okay, let's see the demoscopic clues. Okay, C, 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 A, uh, you know, doesn't have too much on demoscopy, I'd say. But, you know, uh, there is this sign described by, I believe, by Antonella Tosti. But uh, this is the peripillar white or gray halo corresponding to perifollicular fibrotic, uh, concentric fibrosis, sorry. Yeah, it's the main clue. Okay. Okay, we have to consider that uh, a perifollicular white, uh, bright white halo may be also appreciated in lichen plano pilaris because we have uh, a, a follicular fibrosis. But the difference is that here in lichen planus, uh, this halo is thinner and more subtle. Okay, so here is, you know, it's very clear cut, okay, in CCCA. Okay, androgenetic alopecia, of course, we, we all know the dermoscopic features of androgenetic alopecia uh, because, you know, we can appreciate them also on clinical examination. So we have a hair thickness heterogeneity. Uh, so more than 20% of hair, uh, so we have anisotrichia, okay? And we also have more than 10% of vellus and thin uh, hairs, okay? So this is, these are the clues. Okay, peculiarities in the scalp. Of course, we have uh, more accent, uh, more, more yeah, uh, significant uh, perifollicular pigmentation. And we have, of course, the pseudo network. And we have regularly distributed uh, pinpoint white dots corresponding to uh, Eccrine glands openings. Okay, so lichen plano pilaris. Now we know it. Huh? We know it. We have perifollicular white scales. Okay, diffusely distributed. Hmm? We also have, of course, bright white areas, but they may also be appreciated in CCCA because it's uh, scarring. Okay, so summary: CCCA peripillar uh, white or gray halo. Huh? Androgenetic alopecia, anisotrichia, and uh, more than 10% of vellus and thin hairs. Uh, lichen plano pilaris, diffuse perifollicular white scaling. Okay, so this, what do we have here? Thin hairs, no, thin hairs, uh, thin hairs, uh, anisotrichia. I, I don't see the peripillar. Uh, bright white area. This is androgenetic alopecia. This is androgenetic alopecia. We do not see perifollicular scaling. We do not see, um, you know, the peripillar uh, white or gray halo. Uh, the, the pinpoint white dots are regularly distributed. We have hair shafts, but they are thin. Okay? So, this is androgenetic alopecia. Hmm? It's not easy, but, you know, Okay, and this, le let's take a look here. Yeah, yeah. We have the peripillar white halo. This is clear cut. It's very, very well evident. Okay, so CCCA. Okay, this is a very nice diagnosis. It's not easy from a clinical point of view. Okay, here. Androgenetic alopecia, correct, because we have anisotrichia and we have thin hair. Okay, we also have this peripillar sign, which is peripillar pigmentation, due to the presence of sebum, but also an inflammatory uh, infiltration around the follicle uh, that you know may activate uh, melanocytes. Okay, perfect. Androgenetic alopecia, and this one. Lichen plano pilaris. What do we have? We have diffuse white perifollicular scaling. So this is pattern lichen plano pilaris. Okay, and this is uh, yesterday some. Yeah, I, I already spoiled maybe something about this because yesterday someone asked me uh, information about this type of alopecia, 
uh, fibrosing frontal alopecia. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this might be difficult uh, to differentiate you know, from uh, traction alopecia. Hmm? Of course, you may also have uh, an overlap be between these two conditions. Uh, yeah, of course, we, we, we may have a suspicion from a clinical point of view, of course, which is the traction alopecia. Okay. Okay. But are you sure? Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, let's see the dermoscopic clues of these two conditions. So, in fibrosing frontal alopecia, uh, yes, we have perifollicular white scaling uh, similarly to lichen planus pilaris, okay? But unfortunately, uh, the perifollicular white scaling is also present in traction alopecia, so we cannot rely on it. Uh, but the main clue is the lack of vellus hairs and thin hairs. Normally, we have vellus hairs here, okay? Not too many, but we have it, we have them. Um, but in uh, this type of alopecia, we do not see them. Because uh, actually, they are the target of the inflammatory response. So we cannot see them. Okay? We also see these lonely hairs that are uh, hair shafts uh, away from, the, uh, from the, the main line of the hair. Okay? This one is a uh, lonely hair. Okay? Poor. Huh? Okay. Did you get it? Huh? This poor guy, okay? Okay, uh, peculiarities in dark skin. Uh, of course, we may have the perifollicular white fibrotic halo. Mm? It's similar, it's pretty much similar to the, the one that me, we may appreciate in CCCA. But, you know, uh, it's uh, more subtle, less defined. Mm? Okay. And in uh, uh, FFA, we can also see in dark skin uh, pigmentation, peppering, so gray dots, okay, due to the pigmentary incontinence in the dermis. And what about traction alopecia? Of course, we have broken hairs. We do not usually see broken hairs in uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia. But the main clue is the, pres is the persistence of thin hairs. Because, you know, the patient is not able to pull very tiny uh, hairs. Okay, so the question when we uh, come across uh, this differential diagnosis is, do we have vellus or thin uh, hairs or not? If we uh, have them, so it's likely that we are in front of a traction alopecia. If we do not have them, it's likely that uh, this is uh, uh, fibrosing frontal alopecia. Of course, we have also additional findings for example, lonely hairs are more common in fibrosing frontal alopecia, but they are not patognomonic. Sometimes very, very uncommonly, they may also be appreciated in traction alopecia. And broken hairs are more common in traction alopecia, but it's not, you know, uh, specifically uh, yeah, indicative of uh, traction alopecia. Okay, so uh, you already told me that this is traction alopecia. Mm? So she spoiled the diagnosis. But, you know, now, do we have thin hair? Huh? Yes, yes, these are thin compared to these ones. Okay, so this is traction. We have, uh, you know, just a confirmation. Yeah. Okay, traction alopecia. And here, do we have vellus hair? No. So, this is, uh, we have also uh, two poor guys here lonely hairs. So this is frontal fibrosing alopecia. Perfect. So this is uh, so these are some references from what I said till now. Okay, so nail. Azam. Nails. Okay. Uh, you told me you're an expert. Hmm? Uh, so. Professor Enzo, uh, shall we take some questions to give you a gap in between? The, Two the, or three questions from the audience now. Do you have any question about hairs? Huh? At the end, maybe? At the end? Okay. Okay. For, okay. Okay. Nail melanoma. It's not so common, but it may happen. Hmm? So, from, this is melanoma, of course. Huh? 
uh, which are the, the main clinical findings of nail melanoma? Of course, these ones, huh? but especially the Hutchinson sign, so extension of the pigmentation uh, in periungual uh, areas, okay, proximal nail fold, but also distal area. And the, the, the other um, clue hmm, uh, is the, the wideness of the band, okay, more than three millimeters, more than three millimeters. Okay, these, these are the main clues from a clinical point of view. Uh, this is not my paper, okay, but you know, this is, these are actually the general clues. Hmm? Okay, so I have this case. This was a colleague, a very good friend of mine, actually. This is two millimeters. What, what do we do? We discharge the patient. Yes, we discharge the patient. Okay, but you know that uh, doctors are, are not so lucky. Hmm? So, and then besides, he was, uh, he is a very good friend of mine. So, we'll come back to this case. Okay, so dermoscopic clues of nail melanoma. These ones, this is a study we did with International Dermoscopy Society. First, we have irregular, uh, you know, longitudinal lines, okay? This means different thickness, okay? Spacing and color, okay? You can see that these lines are different in terms of thickness, spacing, and also color, okay? Uh, we may also have these pigmented granules, uh, but they are not very specific for melanoma. But, you know, in this study we found this. Uh, bla uh, black gray color, but I'd say mainly black. When there is black, it, you know, the situation is not too good. Uh, micro Hutchinson sign, so pigmentation uh, around the, the nail proximal nail fold, but also distal part, hyponicum, uh, which, is, which is not visible on clinical examination. This is micro Hutchinson sign. Also, nail dystrophy, but when we see nail dystrophy, of course, we can do the diagnosis also on clinical examination. And the triangular band, okay? This may be a clue for uh, melanoma of the nail matrix. Okay, that's it. Uh, okay, L do not confuse micro Hutchinson sign with pseudo Hutchinson sign. This is pseudo Hutchinson sign. Pigmentation is uh, visible uh, through the cuticle, okay, but there is no a real pigmentation of the cuticle of uh, proximal uh, nail fold. Okay, this is important. Uh, so let's come back to my friend. So, what would you do here? Discharge, really? Come on. We have lines, longitudinal lines, which are very uh, different in terms of thickness, uh, color, and spacing. Of course, uh, I cut it out. This was melanoma in situ, of course. But we do not have to rely on the wideness of the band. Of course, when you know, the melanoma is a newborn, it, it, you know, it's not so large, okay? Perfect. And what about this? We have lines, longitudinal lines, are pretty homogeneous, I'd say, huh? in terms of color, hmm? thickness, and spacing. What's this? Nothing. Nothing worrisome. No? This is salentigo, or melanocytic hyperplasia. Huh? So, benign. We can discharge a patient, basically. What about this? Melanoma. But I don't know, because, you know, the lines are pretty homogeneous in terms of, you know, no? no they are quite homogeneous, you know. The color is pretty much the same, also the, the wideness. Yeah, it's, yes, the, the, maybe the spacing, huh? but, you know, the color and uh, the wideness is pretty much good. So this is a melanocytic news, okay. Hmm? 
And this? This is melanoma, come on. Okay. So the lines are uh, different among each other in terms of color, uh, thickness, and spacing. And we also have uh, black color. Black color is not good when we see it uh, on the nail. Of course, uh, in dark skin patients, black is you know, more common, but in very dark skin patients, or Africans maybe. Okay, and we also have uh, nail dystrophy here. Okay, so this is melanoma. But of course, please note another important thing. Uh, if we consider each line, each line, okay, there is, you know, a variable color and wideness of the line. Hmm? Here, uh, it's wider and darker. Here, it's thinner and lighter. Okay, we also have to consider each single line. Okay, so what about this? Of course, this was melanoma. Okay, what about this? Benign? Okay, lines are not very homogeneous, even in the color, also in the wideness, spacing. But if we consider, this is nibus, of course, but if we consider each line, you can see that they are very homogeneous. Huh? Color is the same, huh? wideness is the same. Okay, so we have to consider each line also. And what about this? Melanoma. Do you agree, everyone? Yes? No. No. No, it's not. If I say that this uh, patient uh, had five, I think, years, it was five years old, he was. Five years old? Huh? No. No. This is congenital melanocytic nimbus. This is a challenge because uh, congenital and congenital type nimbus, which means arising uh, within the first five years, but some authors uh, agreed on three uh, years, may display very, uh, very bad findings, okay? as you can see here, but this is not melanoma. So this is a very important challenge. Yeah. Okay, so now I would like to address three common tumors of the nail. Huh? Azam, this is common. Huh? Okay, onychoma trichoma. This is a benign tumor, fiberepithelial tumor of the nail matrix, okay with filiform projections that grow into the nail plate. Okay? Perfect. This is. So, demoscopic clues. We have longitudinal parallel white or yellow bands, lines. Uh, uh, a feature, a characteristic feature is that the, 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 the edge of this band is very sharp. Okay? And uh, we also have uh, splinter hemorrhages, but this is not specific, of course. The other clue is the presence of these cavities, these holes filled with uh, yellow or white or grayish uh, keratotic material, mm -hmm. the woodworm-like cavities. We have holes in the frontal view, of course, of the nail. So, sharp margins, and uh, holes are the main clues of onychoma trichoma. Okay, of course, we may also have uh, nail plate thickening and also a hyperconvexity. Hmm? Okay, another example. Hmm? So, white band, longitudinal band, very sharp edge, okay? And here we have these holes filled with gray keratotic material, here, okay? Uh, there is another clue, this one. This is the shadow, of the pink shadow of the tumor with an irregular outline, okay? Because the tumor is here in the matrix. You can see here, huh? It's very similar. This is the shadow. It's not always visible, but it may be uh, appreciated. Okay, another example. This is only comma trichoma. I saw these cases in a, in a year. Okay, it's not so uncommon. Mo mostly these patients uh, came to me for other reasons. Huh? 
But you know, I'm very curious. So I analyzed the nails and found this, this stuff. So we have the band, very sharp margins. And here we have the holes. Huh? Okay, front of view. So on a comma, tri comma. And here, this is very nice. We have the band, very sharp margins. Okay, and front of view we have the uh, the holes. Huh? These are black because we have hemorrhages here. These are the projections. You can see the projections of the tumor. This is unbelievable. Huh? These are the projections of the tumor in the nail plate. And we may also have these uh, elongated vessels uh, in the proximal part of the nail. Okay. Okay, this is rare. This is one of my cases. Uh, this is on a comma, trichoma presenting with a pigmented longitudinal bands. This is not so common, but we still have the same clues. So, a very sharp margins and the holes, okay, in the frontal view. Okay, so let's remember very, you know, sharp margins and the holes in the frontal view. Okay, what's this? Are a but involving the whole nail plate. This is uh, a challenge because, you know, it, might, it may also, you know, be mistaken for a, a fungal infection, I think. No? It may be. It, it was indeed. Okay. But because we do not see, you know, uh, a well demarcated band, huh? but we do see the cavities huh? on the frontal view. You can see here the holes filled with keratotic material. Okay. Uh, of course, we can differentiate it from an onychomycosis because here onychomycosis uh, displays more irregular uh, white and uh, yellow uh, areas. They are, they are not homogeneous. Okay. It's a mess here. And on the frontal view, we do not have round holes. Okay. But we have this ruined aspect. So a mess, basically. Okay. Okay. So subangual glomus tumor. This is also common. It may be uh, in the nail matrix or nail beds. Okay. We, we all know uh, subangual glomus tumor. Uh, the main demoscopic finding is the presence of an ill-defined, structureless purplish or reddish subangual spot. The margins you can see here are, are not well defined, are, yeah, are ill defined. Uh, we may also have, th this is of course the main presentation, okay? We may also have additional findings. We may have these uh, areas of onycholysis that, you know, appear uh, like this, so white areas. Uh, especially in the peritumoral uh, area. And we may also have sometimes hemorrhages, but this is not specific. Sometimes a uh, subangual glomus tumor may appear like a longitudinal erythronychia. We, have, we may have a clue, which is the presence of uh, roundish proximal or distal end, okay, because the tumor is actually here. Okay, so we may see the, the shadow, the outline. Okay, we do not have to forget to do something with the dermatoscope. The dermatoscope may be dangerous, uh, it's heavy. Uh, we can use to press the nail of the patient and we can produce pain in the patient. Okay, because subangual uh, glomus tumor is a painful tumor. Okay, this is my digit. <laughs> okay. Uh, I did it for you. Uh, subangual glomus tumors of the nail matrix. This uh, is not easy to be diagnosed. It may, you know, uh, oh, sorry, it may uh, look like this, so uh, red lunula. Uh, yeah, it's still painful, of course. But, but, um, you know David Becker, so you know this. Huh? Uh, the, the, the glomus tumor of the matrix is uh, not easy to be differentiated from the uh, mixed pseudocyst of the matrix, huh? type C. They look very similar from a clinical point of view. 
even on dermoscopy, it's not easy to differentiate these two types of uh, lesions. Uh, in both these cases, we may have a uh, distal notch, okay? Yes, the, the color uh, yeah, is a little bit different. Uh, in mixed pseudocyst, it's bluish. In glomus tumor, it's purple. But you know, it may also be bluish in glomus tumor. So we cannot rely on it. Uh, yes, here we have other findings. Uh, in glomus tumor, we have also perilesional onycholysis. This is not so common in uh, mixed pseudocyst of the matrix. And we also have these linear branching vessels. They are not absolutely specific, of course. So it's difficult to differentiate these two things, okay? So this is nice. I did a punch biopsy and everything uh, came out, uh, gelatinous material. Okay, so we, we mainly know this, the type one, the type A, okay, of, pseudos, of mixed pseudocyst. Uh, this is the most popular one. But we also have these two types, the proximal uh, involvement, type B, and the, the, the one involving the matrix. So we, we also have to consider a mixture of pseudosis when we have these uh, two clinical presentations. Okay, even from a dermoscopic point of view, uh, all of them uh, uh, display a bluish background. Okay, uh, these two uh, may also display linear, uh, sorry, linear, linear or linear branching vessels, okay. Type B also display proximal nail fold crusting. And we also may have a notch, a distal notch in the, in the type C, okay. But dermoscopy, uh, I think, is not good for a, a mixer pseudocyst. Do you know the, the best tool to diagnose this, this condition? No? Just light, a light. A light. This is something I did with David De Berker. Uh, the lesions are translucent because you know they are fluid. So here, here they are. Huh? Even the, the 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 type C, which is very difficult, it's translucent. Okay, glomus tumor is not translucent because it's solid. Okay, just a very a couple of words of onychopapilloma. Uh, it's a benign tumor. Uh, of the nail bed or distal matrix, but mainly of the nail bed, I'd say. Okay, uh, it presents like this. So uh, a thin longitudinal uh, pigmented band, which may be red or uh, white or brown, or sometimes just a linear hemorrhage. Okay, main clues on dermoscopy. We have longitudinal band, erythronychia mainly, but the main clue is the presence of Subangual keratotic mass, okay? This is the main clue, under the nail plate. Uh, and also, uh, the, the band, uh, we can say that spares some of the nail plate, so it does not reach the nail fold, okay? Because mostly uh, it involves the nail bed, okay? And we may also see distal fissure and shorter splinter hemorrhages, but they are not specific. Another example, this was a pigmented onychopapilloma. So we have the band, the sparing of this area, and still we have the subangual keratotic mass. This is the clue. Okay, another case. Here we have just an hemorrhage, not reaching Professor. the proximal nail fold. I finished, just one slide. Uh, here we do not see the, the subangual keratotic plug uh, because the patient cut it. It may happen. I. I, I visited her again and here after a few weeks and I, I saw the, the main clue, okay? So, I finished. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, to, uh, we will continue with uh, the next session, which is company